Oh, this it's a live microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all the second meeting of the talk series entitled Europe as an Idea, co-organized by Turkish Prime Minister Public Diplomacy Office and Department of Political Science and International Relations. Today, I have the honor of introducing you a distinguished political philosopher and professor, Susan Buck Morse. She teaches political philosophy and social theory in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Professor Buck Morse wrote several books and articles on the continental political philosophy social theory, critical theory, Marx and after, modern social theory, Islamism and comparative political theory. As you know, her three books are translated into Turkish and published by Metis. Some of her books to be mentioned here are Hegel, Haiti and Universal History. Actually, Professor Buck Morse was awarded Franz Fanon Book Prize 2011 for this excellent book. Dream World and Catastrophe, The Passing of Mass Utopia in East and West, The Dialectics of Seeing, Walter Benjamin and Arkadesh Project, The Origin of Negative Dialectics, Theodor Adorno, Walter Benjamin and Frankfurt Institute, and lastly, Thinking Past, Terror, Islamism and Critical Theory on the Left. I should admit that as a student of Islamism, I have benefited a lot from your book on Islamism and critical theory. The subject of the today's talk is democracy as an unfinished project. Professor Buck Morse will concentrate on the question of are people not yet ready for democracy or is democracy not yet ready for people? certainly within the context of Arab Spring. And Professor Ahmed Okumush from Department of Political Science and International Relations is the discussant of today's uh, speech, Professor Mark, uh, Buck Moore's talk. And finally, it's my pleasure to invite Professors Buck Moore's and Okumush to the podium for their speeches. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's working. Is that good? All right, I'm going to stand up because I just arrived from New York City and I want to stay awake. <laughs> so uh, this will get me energized. Um, first, I want to say how honored I am to be here uh, as a guest to the government of Turkey, a nation that is playing such a crucial role in international events at the moment a moment of enormous promise and also enormous risk. Uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you also for, uh, Ahmed, for, uh, for being ready to do the um, 
comment, even though you did not get the paper beforehand, which is very brave, and I appreciate it. Um, my talk will be a tentative one on issues about which I am far from certain. I will attempt to speak not to you, but with you, not about the West and not about Europe, but about us together as we think our way into a future, the contours of which we cannot know. Our sensitivity to these changes opens the way for what I've called elsewhere a pragmatics of the suddenly possible. It is in this tentative and yet hopeful spirit that I speak to you today. And my first hypothesis is a counterintuitive claim. Globalization is a transformation of time, not space. In other words, it is producing a new time, not just a new era, but a new sense of time, universally shared, that transforms our understanding of time itself. A temporal topography necessarily structures the empirical world, but the present disruption of collective imagination is the disarticulation of the time of modernity, while historical actors in multiple countries are politically engaged at this moment, producing new global realities that even a short time ago were considered unimaginable. The prevalence of um, the term globalization in the Western press dates to the 1980s, and everyone at the time assumed it was an extension in space of European modernity, secular reason, the capitalist economy, patterns of consumption, neo-imperialism, US hegemony, or simply the West. In other words, this was going to be the kind of universalization of the world under Western hegemonic principles. But these descriptions did not grasp the fact that the first world nations were actually slipping from their first place status economically, militarily, and ideologically. A dialectic was in play. The spread of existing forms, far from increasing Western dominance, has been in the process of undermining it. At the beginning, this was very difficult to perceive. Um, with the end of the Cold War, globalized Westernization seemed unstoppable. The USSR had ceased to exist, communist China, embraced both modernity and the, uh, and the markets, and with the failure of old-style socialism, Western Marxism too lost credibility. Many governments, not only in the developed world, were actually benefiting from economic globalization. The global consumption of fashion and food and entertainment appeared capable of providing some sort of cultural cement across every imagine, imaginable political divide. The steadily increasing influence of the IMF or the World Bank promised supranational guidance for the new economy. The European Union was at that time a success from which Turkey remained excluded in what now appears to have been your country's great good fortune. Fukuyama's 1989 essay, The End of History with a question mark, had enormous resonance in the global public sphere suggesting that Western liberal forms might signal the end of human development itself. Now, against the neoliberal em embrace of these developments, critical theorists cautioned restraint, claiming that modernity in its really existing forms had not yet lived up to its concept and history was far from over. That modernity was still an unfinished or incompleted project was argued by Jürgen Habermas in order to defend the project of modernity. In a much cited speech from 1980, he protested against the dominance of instrumental rationality, which separated the practices of science and politics from the life worlds of morality and aesthetics that needed to be integrated into the logics of public life. Now Habermas was speaking of and for Europe, and yet his very conception of the modern project implied the universality of his philosophical claims. 
he failed to consider the fact that modernity's global triumph was also revivifying other social worlds, precisely those non-Western countries, including Turkey, whose economic and social modernization was successful, were discovering alternative paths forward, taking up his challenge outside of the specific modernist paradigm that Habermas had described, and exposing the fact that in its presumed universality of content and objectivity of method, the modernist paradigm was culturally specific and, as a consequence, uniquely inadequate. In Turkey, and I'm going to try the names, Ahmet Davutoglu, yes, <laughs> the present foreign minister of Turkey, argued from within Western philosophical debates and by means of Western conceptual schema that modernity as a project was unfinished and needed the non-West in order to be fulfilled. Dav Davutoglu's argument is the inspiration for the title of my talk, which supports much of what motivates his claim, but questions the effectiveness of his categories and procedures. Javut Tohulu's 1994 text engaged Habermas directly. He did so with an appeal to the Islamic paradigm of thought or worldview, Weltanschauung. His was an act of political resistance against military rulers of Turkey's secular nationalist state to argue for the political mobilization of Islam as a means of furthering political democracy and cosmopolitan tolerance. Here is the critical passage. Is modernity a static objective to be reached or an unfinished project as it has been described by Jürgen Habermas? And if it is an unfinished project, what will be the role of non-Western civilizations which have been the objects, object of this project in the next phase? Is secularization an irreversible part of this universal project or a culture-bound one. Now, like Habermas, Davutoglu uses the concept of life worlds to describe the lived experience of the individual, grounding that lived experience in cultural authenticity. Given the imposition from above of secularist social forms in, uh, on Turkey's population during the Kemalist years that did violence to the life world of the majority of, uh, of the Islamic majority, his questioning of the necessity of secularization for the modernizing process is appropriate and indeed compelling. But I would question whether an individual's life world translates seamlessly into a civilizational perception as the civilizational perception is a collective identification that extends far away from his or her, an individual's, uniquely lived experience. And a civilization takes in broad expanses of time and space. So it is the concept of civilization that needs to be unpacked at this point. For though it clearly connects Javutoglu's discourse with the do a dominant one in the global public sphere, there is reason to be skeptical of its analytical non-ideological power. The term civilization places Davutoglu's work in proximity, of course, to Samuel Huntington's thesis first formulated in 1992, the clash of civilizations and the making, remaking of the world order. Now he wrote that in the context of the Bosnian War that followed the breakup of socialist Yugoslavia and he took seriously the populist rhetoric of the combatants that engendered ethno-religious hatred between Catholic Croatians, Muslim Bosnians, and Christian Orthodox Slavs. He claimed that as manifestations of conflicting civilizational identities, these hatreds were anticipatory of events to come. The clash, I'm quoting now Huntington, the clash of civilizations will dominate global politics, the fault lines between civilizations, of which the Bosnian conflict he saw was one, will be the battle lines of the future. 
Now, it seems to me that Davo Tohulu's use of the term Islamic civilization had very different political implications because the dividing line, the fault line between civilizations was inside Turkey itself. At a time when the secular nationalist military rule made Islamic styles, lifestyles illegal and women in the university donned the hijab in defiance of the law, his affirmation of the Islamic life world was a democratic act of inclusion of Turkey's religious populations against the forced modernization of the Kemalist state. So his appeal to cultural authenticity of Islam was not only counter-hegemonic, but courageous, an act of resistance against the repressive regime. So intellectually, it is not the Islamic the thematics that concerns me with Davo Tohulu's approach. Rather, it is his reliance on Western methodologies, specifically 20th century German phenomenology in which both he and I have been schooled. From Diltai, he takes the concept of Weltanschauung, or worldview. From Husserl, he takes the notion of phenomenological reduction. And from Heidegger, he accepts a philosophical ontology grounded on the concept of authenticity. My own study of this tradition was mediated by the critical theory of Theodor Adorno through whose reception I acquired a suspicion of all ontological claims, whether constituted by epistemology or constitutive of it. And I'm referring here to Davut Tocholu's striking distinction between the Western philosophical tradition, which he says is an epistemologically determined ontology, and the Islamic tradition, which he says is an ontologically determined epistemology. But I don't want to get into the philosophical detail at this point. For present purposes, my general criticism can be stated quite plainly, although I will get back to ontology later on. And my general criticism is this. To presume any civilizational authenticity, Islamic or Western, we would have to establish that such a phenomenon as an authentic civilization exists and that they provide civilizations provide analytic categories stable enough to do the work of differentiating the life worlds of individuals and the groups that inhabit them. Now the distinction uh, between civilizations was actually a 19th century German invention. Prior to that time, you can talk about the Enlightenment, for instance, there, was just, there were just two categories, the civilized or civilization and barbarism which included, of course, all of the colonized people and was part of the reason why they had to be colonized, right? But, uh, so civilization was simply against barbarism. But in the late 19th century, in Germany, under this wonderful burgeoning of historical research, a civilization was understood to be um, a discrete differentiation from others of which there could be multiple civilizations. And then Toynbee came into the picture in the uh, 20th century between World War I and World War II and actually described something like 25 civilizations, separate civilizations. And it's through this kind of work, it's a rhetorical work, it's a discursive work, that the whole concept of civilization seemed to have some reality. Right? That, was a, that was a construction done by historians themselves. Under the influence, it must be said, of Hegel, right, who broke away from an exclusive focus on political events for writing history. In other words, prior to Hegel, histories were mainly about wars and rulers and empires. Hegel changed the course of history writing. His philosophy of history describes sequential manifestations of Weltgeist, world spirit. Authentic, right? From Oriental to Greek to Roman to German and modern, and he understood collective life as expressed in a multiplicity of objective forms, language, custom, law, art, and centrally, religion. Now, um, even when modernity in its globalized spread as a kind of universal civilization 
threaten to engulf these differences, civilizational distinctions remained valid as a form of discourse and historical research. Now, Muslims have traditionally divided the world into Dar al-Islam and Dar, Dar al-Harb, the abode of peace and the abode of war. Now, that binary distinction is a bit closer to the European Enlightenment conception of civilization versus barbarism. But Davut Toglu's understanding of civilization resonates with the Hegelian, Germanic, Western comparative model. This is why I criticize him. I mean, only because I'm critical of that model. His argument is that precisely because of its traditions of tolerance for other cultures, Islamic civilization provides a model for the world today. Now, now the best of historical scholarship certainly supports that claim. I'm uh, referring to Mark Cohen, and he's a Jewish historian, Mark Cohen's book, Under Crescent and Cross, who has, with great scholarly thoroughness, compared the actual practices in Europe and the Muslim world over multiple centuries, and he concludes, quote, whether their persecution, he's talking about the Jews, is measured in terms of expulsion, murder, assault on property, or forced conversion, the Jews of Islam did not experience physical violence on a scale remotely approaching Jewish suffering in Western Christianity. At the same time, however, Historians themselves have begun to question the validity of presuming separate civilizations as the most fruitful way to organize their research. The concept of giant civilizations, contiguous in space and continuous over time, influencing one another, borrowing each other's external forms, precludes the fact that in the person-to-person -person exchange of ideas, it is often precisely in those spaces between the giants of civilization that the real creativity of social and cultural life takes place. Indeed, civilizational spaces are so overdetermined by surrounding cultural influences that it is, in my mind, an unjustifiable appropriation for any civilization to claim these human creations as their own. Now, getting back to my earlier point is precisely this training in history that, oh, I'm sorry, I, I really have to read, I'm trying to make it a little briefer because it has to be shorter. The framework of comparative civilizations led to a burgeoning of history writing throughout the 20th century not just interpreting political chronicles or sacred text, but reading culture in all of its aspects. And I am myself, as a historian, a product of that tradition. And yet, to get back to my earlier point, it is precisely this training in history, the changing and contingent nature of human affairs, that makes me suspect of philosophy's ontological claims, because they reify the world. And what is so fascinating in the work of contemporary historians is that even when they start out to tell a story of civilizational difference, their very investigation tends to undermine this assumption. Now here I'm gonna go very quickly over the examples that I have because you may or may not know these people. If you know them, I don't have to tell you what they said and if you don't know them, it's okay. One is Aziz al Azma who has written a book on Muslim kingship. And uh, the, book it, the book is really um, quite fascinating. He's an he's angry uh, sociologist who says, look, there's no such thing as Muslim kingship, absolutely different from any other kind. The, the Muslims who were in uh, Damascus, you know, were part of that milieu, which happened to be one of Sassanid influences and Byzantine influences and Jewish influences and many others. And out of this came the supposedly authentic Islamic political forms, i.e. authentic but already overdetermined, right? Um, so as far as the history of science is concerned, and here I, I quote George Saliba's recent book that makes the strong claim that civilizations cannot be held apart in the story 
of the rise of science, which is the consequence of activities, uh, scientific activities, migrating across cultures. They never stay, stay put, right? So uh, another uh, example is Oleg Grabar, who is an expert on Islamic art. And by the end of his life, he says, you cannot talk about Islamic art without acknowledging that every great work of art is what he calls a hybrid of different influences. The architectural historian Deborah Howard has shown that without knowledge of Islamic cities throughout the Middle East, you cannot understand Renaissance architecture in Venice. Uh, and Hans Belting, in a recent book in German, has shown us that the Renaissance so-called invention of perspective, which was supposedly the founding moment of the European history of art, now we have perspective and we have Renaissance art and it's totally new and totally different, that it would have been impossible without Alhazen's theory of optics. <coughs> Put another way, None of the presumptions behind the concept of civilization, not political imperialism, not religious unity, not ideological hegemony, not territorial exclusion, none of these are necessary for cultural influence and intellectual exchange to take place. Cities on the crossroads of networks have a cultural advantage. Small, Istanbul is a wonderful example. Small kingdoms like Norman Sicily left large artistic legacies. Cross-pollinations were the rule in trading areas. Intentional diasporas, I'm talking about the Hadrami in the Indian Ocean or the, the, from Yemen, the Hadrami, I don't know if those are, that's, that's a new field of research of Eng Seng Ho, um, or the Armenians uh, who settled in three continents. These groups were extremely important in producing a multicultural, intra-civilizational uh, development of creative, cultural, and uh, uh, social forms. <clears throat> so, cross-cultural influence is not strong enough to describe what I consider a universal human characteristic the fact that in the production of cultural life, people work creatively from within the multiplicity of forms that they experience. If the development of modern Europe without the Islamic world would have been impossible, if Islam itself is not a place, nor a religion in the 19th century meaning of the term, why does it make sense to write history in mutually exclusive civilizational terms. Whatever definition you choose, the word cancels itself out insofar as any one civilization is in fact multi-civilizational. In any given slice of time, the giant social units called civilizations are spaces so ecumenically shared that they are not one collective's restricted inheritance. And here I want to talk about different concepts of property. Um, again, some work I'm doing elsewhere, and I tried to find a Turkish word for what I want to talk about here. Um, and it's, could it be paylaşmak, sharing? Okay. Uh, keep that in mind. That would be a new form of property, and it would be very similar to, in French, partager, uh, or in English, to share, right? Um, and it's a, that would be a form of a property, cultural property, that would be different from two preceding ones. The first is patrimony. Patrimony, whether it's national, cultural, religious, or whatever, is property in the sense of something that cannot be alienated, cannot be sold. It belongs permanently and exclusively to a particular collective. And then there is capitalist property, which is just its opposite. If you have capitalist property, your whole point is to alienate it, that is to sell it, because if you keep it, you can't make a profit. So capitalist property is precisely what can be alienated, what must be alienated in order for profits to be made. Capitalist ownership means the right to sell. Now it could be argued that the socialism that we knew in the Soviet Union 
is really a form of patrimony as the public appropriation of property by the state. Whereas what Marx called crude communism, the really crazy idea that you shouldn't have any, that the, Marx was against it too, you shouldn't have any private possessions. That is simply leveled down and universalized envy, the naive negation of a capitalist style privatization. That's essentially that last thing on crude co uh, communism is the point that Marx makes um, himself. But what if a person produce, uh, pardon me, but if what a person produces is judged by its social value, if this entails sharing a person's talents and skills with the largest public uh, possible, then approaching the accomplishments of humanity as a communist inheritance, partagé, par, what is it? Palashmak. Uh, and I, I consider that a communist inheritance of, um, of the accomplishments of uh, humanity, then that would change the understanding of who we are today. In principle, we would all be included. There would be no fault line between us and them. Of course, such a shared notion of social value is just that, an idea, a thought experiment, a way to try to imagine otherwise. A necessary step, it could be argued, to prevent what could be an appalling scenario of ethnic hatreds and nationalist animosities, or simply a reckless profit motor, motive of capitalism that could translate into lethal struggles in the future for water, land, resources, or ecological security. If we keep the us-them model, that's where we are headed. In our age of technological reproducibility, that is Walter Benjamin, there is at least a tendency in the development of the means of production that pushes us toward a different property regime. Its image glimmers on our computer screens with every act of internet sharing. Knowledge-based production tends inherently toward free internet distribution of content. Major steps have already been taken in this direction and initi initiated first by scientists. When the decision was made in 1970, I believe, the decision was made, no, it must have been 1980, I'm sorry. The decision was made for, um, to upload onto the internet the newly mapped human genome and make it free and available free of charge to anybody in the world to download. Indeed, the globalization of research with scholars from all over the world working in collaboration institutionally, educationally, archaeologically, in archives and in laboratories necessitates a paradigm shift in our vision of humanity. Anyone, including myself and I'm sure all of you as scholars, anyone engaged in research is fully aware of the fact that only when those working together don't care at all about differences in ethnicity, religion, race, sexuality, or gender, or any other marker of human difference, only then can the results of one's research lay claim to anything like universal validity. In the 1980s, the slogan, we are all interconnected, was part of a series of films that Carl Sagan and other scientists made to indicate on a scientific level, genetically and in terms of everything that we're comprised of, we are all interconnected, we're all part of the same human family. I do not know when that term, we are all interconnected, came into political discourse. It doesn't really matter when or how, but it did migrate into politics and political discourse. For example, in the massive street demonstrations in Istanbul that followed the murder of the Turkish-Armenian journalist Hrant Dink, who was shot by an ultra-nationalist 
teenager in 2007. The demonstrator's slogan was, we are all Armenians. We are all Haran Dink. As a form of solidarity, as a democratic action in a now globally visible public sphere, thousands of citizens gathered on the streets of Istanbul to protest against nationalist exclusions, setting a standard for other political actors in the world. And it is within this self-consciously global topology that the events of the Arab Spring emerged. We are all Mohammed Bouazizi. We are all Khalid Said. The Tunisian president, uh, Ben Ali, left quickly, but Egypt's Mubarak held on. And the longer he stayed, the stronger <coughs> the people's resistance. The courage of their nonviolent occupation of Tahrir Square held the world in awe, and the Egyptians gained global solidarity and enormous respect. This massive citizen action destroyed the credibility of an entire hegemonic discourse with its claims that the Middle East was not ready for democracy, that the people needed authoritarian government, or most preposterously, that democracy needed to be imposed on the Muslim world from the outside by force of arms. I'm referring to my own country, of course. The democratic revolutions of the Arab Spring happened without leaders, without teachers, without invading armies. This was not a case of Egypt or Tunis catching up with the West. Rather, they were showing the rest of us the way. Their spirit was catching, inspiring citizens in Wisconsin, in Spain, in Greece, in the United, uh, elsewhere in the United States, in Russia, in China, in Syria, in Bahrain, all of these people to take up the banner of democracy. This breath of spring air has initiated a global movement of political protest that is, I would like to say, unlike any that we have seen before. If we were to talk in terms of the Hegelian world spirit, it indeed appears to be universal. Not the end of history, but the end of a certain kind of history and the beginning of something different. The global movement is happening in the name of democracy, and it bears witness to the fact that democracy is an unfinished or incompleted project. Not because it has not yet, yet spread sufficiently from some fully democratized center to the rest of the world. No, democracy as a form of Western modernity has been insufficient, that is deficient, from the start. Let us remind ourselves of the ways this has been the case. <clears throat> the American Revolution that proclaimed all men equal, all men equal, omitted from that definition the unfree labor force of African slaves. The French Revolution only temporarily tolerated the liberation of the African slaves before attempting unsuccessfully to destroy the Haitian Revolution by force. But, and this is the decisive point, even when the institution of slavery was abolished, wage slavery continued. The struggle against economic inequality became the leitmotif of modern society, one that political democracy has still been unable to resolve. Marx, of course, was absolutely clear that as long as you have political democracy, it's actually a signal that you don't have, or you have, pardon me, as long as you have on the level of, poli of politics equality guaranteed by law, it's an admission of the fact that you don't have it at the level of the social, or you wouldn't need the laws. Right. So uh, Marx becomes a central figure on several accounts in our discussion. Not only did he demarcate the structural lim limits of democracy in its French revolutionary bourgeois form, he analyzed the globalizing dynamics of modern capitalism, exposing the internal logic of the system in ways that are today more accurate than ever. So I'm going to then quickly, quickly, 
talk about three paradoxes uh, that still exist, three contradictions that still, still exist indicating the incompleted project of democracy. And the first one is obviously the enormous difference in economic capacity in a population. And now the, the, the gap between the wealthy and the poor has become grotesque. And there is no way for a polity to have a common interest on a political level if its uh, economic realities are so existentially opposed. Um, one does not have to accept Marx's theory of class warfare to conclude that given such enormous disparities of wealth, democracy as an expression of the general will becomes impossible. Political Islam owes much to the Marxist critique of capital, which was widely discussed in the Muslim world during the Cold War. Said Khutb in Social Justice in Islam referred critically to what he called the bloated capitalists. And if you don't know the word bloated, it just means fat and unpleasant. The present leader of Tunisia, Rashid Al-Ghanoushi, has been a long time defender of democracy, and he rejects the myth that free markets, quote, free markets, that is, unregulated capitalism, uh, mean free societies, that is, democratic societies. This theme is part of the global discourse of protest from Egypt to Wisconsin to Greece. We have a strange situation today in which Marx's critique of the global capitalist system is recognized as viable, more true than ever, but Marx's revolutionary politics is totally rejected, as indeed it should be, given the history of communism in its actually existing forms. Now, one important direction of recent historical research has been to show that capitalist systems existed before the rise of Western modernity, notably in the Indian Ocean, and that these early forms, which included um, sophisticated instruments of credit, banking, partnership, the commienda, and trade, were held in check by moral mandates most strikingly by Muslim merchant law. Indeed, I have been developing a thesis that the reason why the West succeeded in launching that new form of capitalism, which scholars in the tradition of Max Weber, religion and the rise of capitalism, Protestant ethic and the rise of capitalism, that scholars in the tradition of Max Weber recognize as definitive, that is, the question is always, why does capitalism really rise in the West and no place else? And the answer is supposedly the Protestant ethic, right? Um, but in fact, if capitalist forms existed before, then what's different about Western capitalism is the colonial system with its unprecedented violence of colonial trade, and that one can therefore argue that the source of Western capitalist development is quite literally because, in terms of the Islamic precedent, because they broke the law. They didn't abide by merchant law, which had a moral imposition of control. One can certainly agree with Ahmed Davut Rogelou when he places economics as necessarily subordinate to social morality. Adam Smith himself would not disagree which is why he intended his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, to be read alongside the better known volumes, The Wealth of Nation, Nations. But it does not follow that Islamic banking provides the answer. At least it is widely criticized in its existing form as simply a clever marketing technique. Or that the institution of zakat is a sufficient cure for the enormous disparities of wealth that make truly democratic societies an impossibility. To argue directly from a religious tenant to practical life is not justified in this case any more than it would be to presume 
that the pacifist message of Christianity, and it's definitely a pacifist message, the symbol is the lamb, right? But would, could one argue that the pacifist message of Christianity provides an adequate basis for ensuring global peace? Obviously not. So the incompleted project of democracy will have to answer the Marxist challenge, its critique of the socially unjust consequences of capitalism in its global form, and it will have to do this without the benefit of Marx's Eurocentric theory of historical stages or his teleology of an inevitable progress through uh, class struggle. Second paradox, between democratic egalitarianism the second paradox is the one between democratic egalitarianism, equality on one hand, and political elitism on the other. Democracy in its radically egalitarian form, um, Davut Toru insists that Islam uh, teaches the absolute equality of human beings. Christianity, of course, does too in, in the, uh, the Apostle Paul's writings, everyone's equal men and women, slave and free. Of course, they remain slave and free, but they're equal. And yet, equality as an ontological assertion, here again you see my bias against ontology, equality as an ontological assertion has time and again proved compatible with political elitism. And this has been true in religious and secular societies. It is in play, in my estimation, among the sectarians of the Gulen movement here in Turkey, who and throughout Central Asia, who, despite their out outspoken adherence to secular pluralism, hold elitist views of ethnicity, nationalism, and Islamic spirituality. It is also in play among Tunisian Francophones, who, having studied in French-speaking private schools, may have read everything that Rousseau ever wrote, and they've read the rights of man in the original French, but they do not extend these democratic sympathies to the actually existing Muslim majority in Tunisia's post-revolutionary order. Conservative parties of the Muslim Brotherhood presume that the leaders know best. The role of democracy, uh, this is from the New York Times, the Egyptian Brotherhood leader Kairat el Shatter. he says he's for democracy. Democracy, however, is limited to the act of voting that provides for his party elect legitimacy, electoral legitimacy, democratic legitimacy, but legitimacy for what? For his party's total unquestioned authority. But again, it is not religion that draws the dividing line between autocratic and democratic rule. Al-Gunushi, with reason, named the government of Bourguiba authoritarian secularism, and the case of Kemalism in secularist, secularist Turkey was the same. So again, the Marxist experience is instructive, but this time as an example of how not to proceed. At least from the time of Lenin, a division was justified between the radical egalitarian goal of a classless society and the dictatorial elitism of communist party rule, essentially preventing any truly democratic practice. Although on paper, if you read this, the constitution of the USSR from 1936, it is the most democratic, it's under Stalin, it's the most democratic document that was a founding constitutional document any place in the world at that time. The fate of the French Communist Party hinged on the question of elitism. As intellectuals, through their own brilliance, and I'm talking here about Althusser, increased the gap between theoretical understanding of Marx and its popular embrace to the point that faith in democratic action was possible, oh, pardon me, and its popular embrace to the point where on the popular level you could have had democratic action. And it was against the intellectual elitism of the French Communist, uh, from a French Communist Party that Althusser, pardon me, uh, um, 
I'm sorry, it was against the intellectual elitism of the French communist philosopher Althusser that his former student, Jacques Rancière, supported the mass street demonstrations in Paris in May 1968 because he took democracy seriously. In a brilliant 1981 essay, in English it's called, uh, it's Le Maître Ignorant, it's the ignorant schoolmaster, it's a parable in historical form, in which Rancière stated, and this must be, if we're going for the incompleted project of democ democracy, this must be our goal. He claimed in forceful terms, all men are not only equal ontologically, but all men have equal intelligence. His claim has nothing to do with IQ, intelligence testing. It is a political claim it means that democracy is precisely the system of government based on the premise that all men have equal capacity for democratic participation. It goes without saying, but perhaps in today's climate, it needs to be said loudly and clearly that all men, in this case means all women too, as their role in the new democratic movements has been invaluable. The subtitle of Rancière's essay, Five Lessons, is Five Lessons in Intellectual Emancipation. It's the strange tale of a French teacher who manages to teach what he does not know. He's ignorant of what he's teaching. He teaches, it, he teaches a book in French to Flemish students, and he can't speak Flemish, and they can't speak French but he manages to teach them a text in French. This is an event that actually happened historically, but it's a parable for Rancière against the elitism of Althusser. He wants to expose what he calls the pedagogic myth that without submitting to a master, you cannot learn. One is reminded of the Muslim women in Egypt, described by the anthropologist Sabah Mahmoud, who met and read together from the Quran without an imam and taught themselves the practice of piety. One is reminded, too, of Wael Gonim's description in Revolution 2.0 of how the Egyptians organized themselves with no teacher and no rulers and no leaders through Facebook, how they gained courage by knowing they were not alone. Uh, Ronim describes uh, that in the demonstrations, you could easily sense what he calls, quote, the wisdom, the wisdom of the crowds. Training in democracy comes by an acting democracy. It, it, its shared experience is a mode of treating others, and I'm quoting from Rancière now from his little parable, not as students or learned men, but as people under the sign of equality. Emancipation is the antithesis of subordination. It involves trust, writes Rancière, based on, quote, confidence in the intellectual capacity of any human being. Tariq Ramadan expresses just this sentiment when he writes, quote, equality is a fragile right and one that must be demanded constantly at more than one level and in more than one sphere. We must have confidence in ourselves and in our rights confidence in our ability to communicate and to be heard, and also confidence in the legitimacy of resistance or even the constructive nature of opposition and protest. There is a critical struggle within Islamic parties at the moment, and it has to deal precisely with the issue of elitism, the pedagogic distance between the people and their leaders. But in Egypt, uh, Kairat al shadr's authoritarian leadership has been challenged by Abdel Manyam Abu Fotou. I hope if you, if you saw it written, might, you might know who I'm saying, talking of, in, that he insists that conservatives have no monopoly on the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt um, or the parties of political Islam. Uh, and Tariq Ramadan has said, that the old brotherhood ideal, which translates into hearing and obeying, 
is gone. It's over, he says. The new generation, Ramadan says, is saying, if this is going to be the way, if it's going to be hearing and obeying, then we're leaving. And he says further, you have a new understanding and a new energy today. So in the name of democracy, let us hope that Ramadan is right. Okay, the third and last paradox of the it, or contradiction in democracy, which means that it's an unfinished project, is the inadequacy of the realization of democracy due to the fact that it's structured within the limits of the nation state. There is almost a constitutive intolerance of outsiders, immigrants. And if formation of a general will within nations makes solidarity across differences a goal, in foreign policy, differences are precisely the point. National self-interest is the legitimating principle. Violation of the democratic rights of others is standard procedure. Double standards of morality and blatant hypocrisy in the practice of ethical norms are a lamentable part of the system. International relations are unequal, undemocratic relations. The deficiency, again, can be traced historically. The concept of democracy as imagined within the bourgeois European model in no way was intended to extend to foreign affairs, where the Westphalian Treaty of 1648, in the context of colonialist practices, remains today binding in its conceptual apparatus. The extension to the United Nations of this conceptual prejudice of the European system of so uh, so sovereignty, which is really Orwellian. All, all nations are equal, but some are more equal than others. Those are the ones on the Security Council who can veto whatever the General Assembly wants, right? Um, and that has been, of course, a major source of the incapacity to act. Now, this state of affairs leads to, in my, for me, as an American, one of the most awful possibilities a grotesque distortion that we see playing out in United States politics today. It is conceivable that an individual can be voted in as president of the United States, the country with the most massive nuclear and conventional weaponry in the world, a person who does not know the basic facts of global politics or the history of 20th century world affairs. Sarah Palin ran for vice president, second on line for the presidency without knowing why North and South Korea were divided or on what side the Germans fought in World War II. <laughs> Rick Perry of Texas, a finalist among Republicans for this year's election, stated in a public televised debate that Turkey should remain excluded from NATO and be cut off from all US aid because the country was ruled by what many would perceive, he says, as Islamic terrorists. I'm sure you were aware of that. It is terrifying to contemplate that if one of these candidates were to be democratically elected, there would be no legal way for the rest of the world to redress the situation even though regime change would be vitally necessary for global security. So those are my three points, and I just have, if you give me a second to kind of say something at the end. It's just How is it that human beings invent new forms of social life? Surely they do. As an example, procreation is natural and marriage is close to universal. But just how human societies arrange these things varies from polygamy to gay marriage. Why such a wide range of human solutions? Cultures differ, but cultures are not set in stone. Even the most established human collectives change, not merely by accident, but intentionally as well. And if people often adopt the customs of their conquerors without much choice, there are also moments of collective invention. Revolutions are defined by such moments. 
even if we have never felt these moments before, even if our experience is only virtual, that is through Al Jazeera, which is how I watched or took part in the events uh, at Tahrir Square, um, we recognize the social creativity of freedom. The spontaneous sense of solidarity that we feel with collectives who are engaged in such a process tells us that there is something profoundly and universally human about this action. That might be an ontological suggestion, but that's okay. To say that revolution is a rupture in history is not the most radical claim that one can make because rep revolutionary moments can pass and people can go back to their life as usual. The true rupture is in consciousness, how we imagine the present given the reality of the revolutionary past. No matter what the future brings, the collective experience of freedom for us is now a global, pardon me, is now globally a historical fact. Democracy is known to be real and we would be using too weak a form of expression, too idealist, too platonic to say that democracy is a pre-existing idea and it is actualized in a revolutionary event. No, the connection needs to be reversed. The very fact, the undeniable reality of collective action gives birth to the idea. The idea of democracy exists because it is enacted. Democracy can exist in thought and can be thought again because it happened. Yet each time it occurs, the idea expands. Democracy changes its meaning, means more, as the actions of specific collectives bring it to life in a particular form, different, yet every time recognizable as itself. Thank you. I think I have to stay here. I have no other microphone. <laughs> First of all, it is a pleasure to be part of this event and to engage in a debate on such timely issues and with an important intellectual of our times. But unfortunately, since I did not get the paper, this rich <laughs> paper, uh, I will just make a few comments on the central topic of the presentation of speech, democracy, an incomplete or incompleted project, and raise a number of questions referring not only uh, the presentation today, but also uh, to some of your previous pieces, writings, uh, or comments. Uh, now for students of political theory, it is usual to acknowledge that the concepts we employ in our public political life have an essentially contested character. When it comes to using these concepts interculturally, the problem gets much more complicated, sometimes to the point of becoming a question of what some call incommensurability or untranslatability. In the case of democracy and its prospects in the Muslim world, these issues intensify due to the fact that, far from being a handy formula or ready-made package of rights and liberties, democracy is in itself a highly contentious theme, as recent debates in democratic theory amply testifies. Contemporary literature in political theory is replete with proposals, sometimes radically divergent from one another, to rethink and refashion current democratic practices. It might then be argued that challenges to democracy are to a great extent internal to democracy itself, or at least to current form, forms of democracy. Yet despite this contentious character of democracy and despite this rich variety of democratic visions and proposals, two accounts of democracy stand out as much more relevant, especially given the now decades-long debates over the compatibility or incompatibility between democracy and Islam. According to the first account, democracy is basically a decision and participation procedure designed to render political authority as accountable to the people as possible as open to citizen participation as possible. But there is another account of democracy, taking the down of democratic age as more comprehensive than democracy itself, 
in terms of its metaphysical implications of its culmination in a general symbolic mutation by which the metaphysical banisters of political authority are lost. Hence the famous phrase of Claude Lefort, the loss of markers of certainty. Now in this bifurcation of accounts, the first account would sound much more sympathetic or comprehensible for most Muslim constituencies and not merely for its contemporary relevance for historically contingent reasons, the Arab Spring again, but also on normative grounds. After all, as the ancients, Muslim or Judeo-Christian said, vox populi, vox dei, if my pronunciation of Latin is correct, of course. The voice of the people is the voice of God. The first account would then come more tenable to us for its contemporary urgency as well as its broad normative implications. But what if the second account better captures the distinctive problematic of our time? What if it gives us a better grasp of contemporary democratic experience? As it seems to me, given the repositioning of religion today, which is captured by expressions like re-enchantment of politics, resacralization or desecularization of the world, deprivatization of religion, not to say the revenge of God, the second account touches the heart of the matter, especially when we approach the question of democracy's relation to faith, traditions, or religions. It opens up a more relevant level of reflection, a level where ontological considerations about the sacred, about self, finitude, mortality, and God are at issue. It also constitutes a more fruitful base for mutual engagement between contemporary Western and non-Western political imaginaries. But until very recent times, this level of reflection and engagement has usually been sidelined in democratic political thinking. What we have seen in most mainstream democratic thinking was a strategy of avoidance with respect to ontological considerations or comprehensive conceptions of the good life. The underlying assumption behind this strategy has been that too much talk of ontology of conceptions of the good life generates hostility. Accordingly, a kind of proceduralism, proceduralism in politics, designing the fair procedures of deliberation and excluding comprehensive conceptions from public processes of deliberation, has been hailed as the most prudent uh, or reasonable approach to politics. But the question is if this strategy of avoidance is reliable or tenable in re-enchanted times. Does it provide us with sufficient resources to come to terms with our contemporary predicament regarding the role and place of faith traditions in our public political life. The question is to capture the most relevant level of conversation, the most suitable frame of questioning, and the most productive form of engagement. In recent years, partly under the pressure of events, democratic thinking start to take some steps in this direction, in the direction of acknowledging the need for the articulation of ontological backgrounds of, for, of our political commitments. A good case in point is the work of William Connolly, American political theorist, who argues to be human is to be inhabited by existential faith. There is no vacuum in this domain, though there might very well be ambivalence, uncertainty, and internal plurality. On this reading, there is no constituency that is simply faithless. Acknowledging the ubiquity of faith Connolly searched for a politics open to political articulation of different faith traditions. Another example is the work of Jeffrey Sitote, who gives a very interesting account of democracy as a tradition. I quote, it inculcates democracy as a tradition, inculcates certain habits of reasoning, certain attitudes towards deference and authority in political discussion, and love for certain goods and virtues and it has an ethical substance, end of quote. Notice how close the definition of democracy here to our general understanding of religion, inculcating certain habits of uh, uh, patterns of action and certain virtues. One could hopefully say that today, under the pressure of events and given these new directions in democratic thinking, we are now slowly approaching a more favorable context and a more relevant frame of questioning regarding the promises and prospects of democracy vis-a-vis -vis 
belief systems. Professor Buckmore's theoretical interventions and attempts during the last decade display an exemplary mode of engagement contributing to the formation of such a favorable context and frame of debate. Her rightly celebrated work on the affinities between Islamism and critical theory is a case in point, an attempt at transcending the Eurocentric frame of much mainstream critical political thinking. It is also a contribution in the currently growing subfield of comparative political theory. Today, uh, in your presentation, you referred to a number of paradoxes. And when it comes to democracy, a central paradox is the paradox of uh, democratic founding. And many political thinkers stress the difficult difficulty of democratic founding. Rousseau comes to mind here, who says, for an emerging people to appreciate healthy maxims and follow the fundamental rules of statecraft, the effect would have to become the cause. In other words, for the attainment or achievement of democratic self-rule, good laws are required, but good laws are themselves possible only if nurtured and cultivated by some sense of democratic self-rule. The agonized the agonizing birth of democracy in an undemocratic setting is the scene of this paradox. As it seems to me, Professor Blackmores is grappling with the same issue here. Taking a leaf from Rancière and his notion of the ignorant schoolmaster, she explores the possibility of achieving democracy where it is not. How to move towards democracy out of a non-democratic condition? How to teach, learn what you don't know? how to achieve the rule of the people under such circumstances. Here the idea of the people is a key motive in all these questions, because democracy is ultimately sustained by the people. In some of her other writings or speeches, Professor Buckmore stressed, I quote, the people today is not a national constituency, solidarity that crosses state boundaries is required. Resistance to power will be a global moment, or it will fail. Again, elsewhere she said, I quote, in modernity, the idea of the people itself is a religious, mystical idea. Also, I quote, with Egypt, we have the incarnation, the embodiment of the idea of the people. Now, it is precisely at this point that I'd like to raise a couple of questions for some further elucidation. The sociological determination of the idea of the people, or demos, has from the very beginning remained elusive and remained in tension between two figurations. On the one hand, a faceless entity. On the other hand, a self-evident subject, a, ma a macro subject, maybe a super subject. On the one hand, anonymity of a mass. And on the other hand, an agent of will. The former triggered fears about a menacing chaotic mob. The latter, fears about totalitarian fantasies of the people as one. Especially the latter image, the people as a self-evident, unitary whole, able to act with a single will, has been questioned by some democratic theorists due to its affinities with the metaphysics of subjectivity, illustrating the people as a supra-subject and leading to totalitarian images of people as one. Today, a similar tendency could be discerned in some critical political thinkers, that is, the tendency to conceive the people as an absent presence, as an elusive figure. And now the power of this idea is obvious. And it is a welcome corrective to previous notions of self-evident oneness of the people. Its elusive, unmasterable quality is its very power. But does not the same conception confine the efficacy or the agency of the people to some to sometimes powerful yet ultimately episodic interventions? How could the people construed this way, incarnated only with or during some momentous events, be the agent for any sustained struggle for transformation? Is not the elusiveness or the fugitive character of the people favorable to capitalism as well? And isn't there a tension between the need, you elsewhere emphasize and also today, for developing wider solidarities about national constituencies on the one hand, and the range of our capacity for collective action or the capacity of the people for collective action on the other? 
What are the implications of pedagogical emancipation for the possibility of peoplehood? Lastly, do you see the fruition of a new form of political agency in the Arab Spring? Similar questions could be raised in relation to the concept of civilization uh, as well. Now, I fully agree uh, about the problem of reification when we use the concept of uh, civilization. Uh, in a criticism of Huntington's clash of civilizations, uh, an international political theorist once had said, civilization and real politic. Actually, uh, clash of civilizations is a portrait of a civilizational real politic. Uh, but on the other hand, despite their diversified, differentiated character, uh, I think we could take civilizations as integrated wholes. Uh, at a general level of abstraction, we could take civilizations as integrated wholes with internal diversity, and this for practical, political, as well as for scholarly reasons. I remember uh, Wallenstein once saying, uh, civilization is about the politics of the present. Now, civilization is a powerful, is a uh, crucial ground, crucial site for the organization of resistance. This is why Wallenstein takes civilization or civilizations as counter systemic forces. And on scholarly grounds, uh, I think now there are other uh, initiatives or attempts. Uh, Schumel Eisenstadt and uh, his circle, for instance, they are trying to develop a historical sociology of civilizations and taking in into account both the diversity and commonality of among civilizations. The Axial Age, for instance, as a major breakthrough for uh, major civilizations are, uh, is center stage in their account. Uh, and cultural borrowing is also an important element in their account. Uh, and also, some argue that authenticity of civilizations are not in the elements, but in the synthesis, in the synthesis of common elements. Uh, this might be a good way of approaching civilizations, but in the case of Heidegger, for instance, I remember uh, he sees in the example of Buddhism a tradition or maybe a civilization where there are elements or there is certainly one element which is comp completely alien or which is absent in the tradition of Western philosophy, the question of, the question of nothingness. So both in the elements and in the synthesis, at the level of elements and at the level of synthesis, we could take civilizational wholes as differentiated unities, but becoming fully aware of the problem of reification. So in critical theory, uh, just like in the question of people, when it comes to the question of civilization, I see a bit the, the, the debate is a bit tilted towards uh, or against the problem of re re reification. But on both practical political grounds and on scholarly grounds, don't we still have some hope in the concept of civilization as well? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I thought that was really Brilliant, and considering you only had four lines of description <laughs> of my paper, you did a lot. And, uh, I really thank you. I think those are totally on target, and I hope we'll have a discussion. So I just to say really quickly a couple of, just very quickly, yeah, or, yeah, um, uh, maybe going, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, you're right on all of these points. First off, the people, uh, you know, uh, 
it's, uh, you know, it, 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 Vox Populi, Vox Dei, it, and this actually has been, uh, I, when I was in Tunis recently, people were talking, using that, that term too, and uh, voice of God on the street is also, you hear in some demonstrations. Um, you know, who are the people? I, 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 short, I just went around that question. I didn't deal with whether it was Egypt or whatever. I just skirted around and sort of said we and said just because I watch Al Jazeera, I belong to this collective and that's a little bit self-serving on the one hand and also uh, problematic because I'm not there for the long haul. And uh, you're right, the, the uh, elation of a moment does not produce systemic change. It may get rid of the old, but it, to construct the new is a much more differentiated process than simply getting out on the street. It's absolutely right. So there, um, I can't say anything in my defense except for the fact that uh, for me as a theorist, uh, the, an important part of theory is to shift conceptual understandings and not to harden them not to say, okay, we have these different nations, so let's see what's specific about Egypt, why Egypt is not the same as Tunis or Tunisia or, you know, what, that these places are really different. Uh, when we know that a lot of these countries had boundaries uh, by the weirdest chance or because that was the straight line that the British Empire drew or whatever. So, I mean, this, the, the uh, but you're right, because no one's saying that this is a totally static model. The fact that things are synthesized in a certain way through a dynamic process gives a certain kind of coherence. But that coherence is just as unstable, I would like mm -hmm. to suggest, as the people. Um, and indeed, the people is a very unstable category as well. I mean, are the Kurds included in the people of Turkey? Uh, you know, does, do the people include all Turk ethnic groups in Central Asia? What, you know, who are the people? And it seems to me that the only way to avoid the uh, the dangers of the super subject, very important question, is to keep that, uh, those lines of collectivity so much interwoven and so much crossing boundaries. So, you know, there's a wonderful thing about the feminist movement on a global level. It really did allow people who came together talking differently about their situation, but able somehow to produce a collective for political action uh, that wasn't dependent on uh, national identities, and uh, many other groups have done the same. So I, I think that um, what I would really want to see politically, I mean, I feel we are all Egyptians. I felt I was Egyptian. Uh, certainly the people who, who demonstrated in Wisconsin had signs. We, you know, thank you, Cairo. We are Egyptians too. We, you know, we are doing what you did. This is our Tahrir Square. That, that it seems to me, is extremely important in, in contrast to what I got in social science on, uh, on the Middle East, which was that big fat book, Democracy Without Democrats, with a question mark, you know, indicating, well, you know, they're sort of putting the democratic processes in place, but they are not democratic people, so what can you do? I mean, this, this it seems to me, is what I want to avoid. I, I, I'm against Bill Connolly's use of ontology and authenticity as well. He's not uh, someone who would come out unscathed from the same criticisms that I'm giving, so you're, you're right to put him in on the other side. I, I also thought that you're, you're uh, um, I mean, in a certain way, civilization becomes a, a um, strategic identity um, or a tactical identity. I mean, it becomes something that does certain political work or certain intellectual work without which we're really in trouble. But it seems to me that, for instance, um, clash of identities, when that just, I mean, somehow or other it caught on, which m must mean that there's something in it. But remember what happened in the, in the wake of the clash of, uh, pardon me, the clash of civilizations. Uh, did I say identities? A little tired. A clash of civilizations. Um, and that was, oh, we have to get over the clash of civilizations. Let's have a dialogue of civilizations. Now, I've been to quite a few meetings of dialogues between civilizations. And what happens, this is why I, it, practically what happens is you come not because of anything but the fact that you belong to a certain civilization. So you are a representative who's there to say, you know, if I said, you know, I was reading Said Khutb the other night and I really think that he says it just the way I feel it, that wasn't what they invited me for. They want me to come 
to talk about what it is to, to represent the Western point of view, the Western Weltanschauung or something, to make the argument in a debate from the West. But that only produces an identity that I don't want to, I, I don't want to inhabit. Um, and that, that, I mean, that's what I think, at least in intellectual circles, can be really dangerous. Sociologists do also make use of these terms. And I know this axial age that was also, is used, also used by David Tohlu in his, his work. Um, you will tell me afterwards over a, a, a good uh, a cup of coffee why it's such a helpful idea, because I don't know enough about it. And I'm going to open it up now to uh, the, the floor, because uh, um, I'd really like to hear what you have to say. But again, thank you very much for the comments. They were really helpful. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Yes. Uh, first of all, I thank you very much uh, for your uh, coming here and giving us this talk. Uh, I don't want to bore you uh, and tire you further as seeing you so much uh, tired, but I will have a, a somewhat long question uh, about the very topic. Uh, you have touched upon almost uh, virtually all the questions and issues that have troubled, troubled my own mind for the last two years, especially about this civilizational thesis, democracy, inequality, and how they come together in the context of especially Turkey's uh, foreign and domestic policy mm -hmm. and the recent events in the Middle East. Uh, especially uh, troubling my mind was the very question you asked, why Davutoğlu himself uses these uh, concepts from phenomen phenomenology, like Weltanschauung, Lebenswelt. Uh, what uh, interested me first when I was reading uh, his this, uh, dissertation, which was later turned into a book, Alternative Paradigms, that he refrains from using civilization, and he says that civilization is actually uh, denotes it denotes uh, material achievements uh, of a people. So he rather chooses Weltanschauung as a c category, and he defines it uh, as a triad relation uh, between man, God, and nature. And what uh, distinguishes the West and Islam, actually, is uh, the specific formulation of this triad relation. In the West, uh, the persistence of this ontological question, uh, the proximity between man and God, he says, uh, posits uh, man and God uh, in one camp against nature which uh, eventually produces capitalism and uh, demonification of the nature and eventually enlightenment, of course. And uh, just the opposite uh, in the Islam, Islamic civilization, Islamic Weltanschauung, he says, man and God are so separated with the idea of tanzi yeah. in the Islamic theology uh, that man and nature is in one camp and God is in another camp. So there is uh, this actually is a very promising argument. I mean, uh, very left indeed, because it's, uh, you could say it's green, because it doesn't demonify nature. It uh, suggests a peace between man and nature, uh, and it's promising. But later, in Davutoğlu's writings, especially the Turkish translations, in his Turkish articles, we see uh, the word civilization, or rather its translation, uh, medeniyet, is being increasingly used. Well, I, I myself looked into this a bit. I mean, in the 70s, as you said, uh, Kutub uh, and Shariati and other uh, leftist thinkers had, had a huge impact in Turkish Islamism too. I mean, Kutub's uh, book, Social Justice, and his other books, you could find them virtually in every household, Muslim household at least, or Shariati was translated and was widely read. And it was, uh, it had an influence in the uh, political past that led to uh, Justice and Development Party eventually. But after 70s, uh, maybe they, that you could, we could attribute to this different uh, impacts, like, such as we could say it's a, it was a result of the coup, but I'm not sure about that. Or you could say it was about the neoliberal, neoliberal global transformation. But this uh, leftist tone, or this uh, Islamic, it's this Islamism which stressed equality and economic justice and uh, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, waned and left its place to this, to this vague uh, civilization idea. I mean, 
I can trace it back to Sezai Karakoç, the prominent Islamic scholar, but I, I, I'm not sure about that. But then there is... No, but, oh, but it's such a good question. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, again, is, I'm very sorry. Good. I'm tiring you out, and yeah. I, I'm, I guess people are bored too, but please, please be with me. Uh, I, I think Turgut Cansever was another huge influence. Uh, I mean, his work on Islamic uh, architecture, especially Ottoman architecture, urban, aste urban and aesthetic experience. He used the uh, word medeniyet, the civilization, uh, insistently. Well, and in the last p p uh, past 15 or 20 years, you might say this word civilization is the catchword. I mean, the keyword for whichever uh, uh, Islamic thinker, Islamic political and social thinker in Turkey you might think of. It's the keyword. People are writing books on it, books and books on it. And now, as far as I heard, Ibrahim Kalın himself, the chief advisor to the prime minister, will, is himself working on a book on the concept of civilization. It's interesting. I mean, it has to have some explanatory power, uh, either in Turkish politics, to explain Turkish politics. Well, there is an interesting... Uh, okay. hmm. Could I just dialogue with you at of that course. moment? I mean, of I course. really find this interesting, but I want to sort of suggest, um, and it, it, it overlaps something that you, you, you brought up. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about the word civilization is it allows you to have more influence than just in your own nation state. Yes. So there's a kind of uh, politics of power involved there. It's sort of saying, we're hegemonic in this region. Yeah, it's I, a regionalism, I, mm -hmm. which allows one group, I mean, it could be Brazil in Latin America, it could be uh, Turkey here, it could be China. These become, because they're somehow uh, the articulators of the, of the civilization, they become the home base. So I think it has a very uh, uh, powerful political effect. Yeah, I, I have heard this argument, and I, I believe it's true, because I have heard from an international IR student, uh, a friend of mine has said that, well, uh, it's virtually always uh, in the context of geopolitics that the civilization comes up in, uh, yeah. as an argument. Yeah. Uh, so it makes sense. Uh, and I, I myself, as a political science grad student, uh, I, I'm not satisfied with civilization as a concept. I mean, I, when I first read, I mean, Foucault's archaeology, he especially attacks this idea, these concepts like Weltanschauung, civilization, culture, historical eras. He says these are just uh, untenable as uh, un, uh, operation, inoperable as. Uh, concepts, and they usually gloss over and uh, hide so more I, than they... Now I, I'd say maybe we should, I don't know, if, I'm seeing a little impatience uh, okay, in the okay. front okay. Uh, My question will be, well, there, there's just a very uh, interesting argument lately from a scholar, again, uh, criticizing the civilization thesis, and he says, uh, from, uh, he conducted a very uh, long scholarship, and comparing West and East, uh, West and Turkey, he says, well, in the West, civilization as an argument came uh, as a result of secularization of uh, Christianity, especially in Britain and French, in the era of capitalism and colonization. So the question is... And he says this is what's happening in Turkey. Uh -huh. So the uh, question He says actually civilization is a secularization of uh, Islamic argument and actually uh, is a, uh, serves the interests of a nation-state uh, geopolitics. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? <laughs> oh no, I, I'm done. Uh, uh. <laughs> I was wondering why you didn't mention Gramsci. Mm -hmm. That's one reason. The other thing, I share your ideals, so you're speaking to my heart. But then I have to ask you the question that I keep asking myself all the time. In, whether in any given country, the arguments for democracy have to be uh, coming together around certain ideas, how do we generate, where do these ideas come from? Mm -hmm. But in the global, in global terms, like your talk was appealing to all these ideals, 
which I said I share, mm -hmm. what kind of yeah. thing in terms of procedures, thing in terms of institutions, who are going to make them sort of uh, mm -hmm. penetrate, become diffused enough mm -hmm. to generate some kind of a movement that you can recognize as, aha, uh -huh, it's happening. What I have, my, this yeah. idea, it's happening through this. And of course, once you think in terms of those institutions, then you have to think in terms of counter institutions. You mentioned certain examples from the states, but so many efforts to bring, to generate a dialogue when there were people who said, we were all, we are all Egyptians. This is our tahrir. Then there were so many others who said, Fesubhanallah, yani, uh, God forbid. And their voice to me, their voices to me were far more strong. Mm -hmm. And also in Turkey, we can mention that many of us said we are all Armenians, but then others said Armenians are son of bitches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we are all son of, yeah. you are yeah. all son of bitches. Yeah. So I mean, there are, and that was a far better organized movement than the one that organized, mm -hmm. like in the United States. Yeah. So what's happening? I mean, without taking into consideration all these institutions, procedures, how they're going to be enduring, all we say are merely ideals, are empty talk. Well, I'm that's, afraid. we're we intellectuals, that's this is our <laughs> what our specialty is, but uh, no, I mean, great. Um, and I will say something, you know, uh, my class just read, what, we're kind of we're talking about horizontal democracy and, and democracy for the 21st century is the, is the seminar I'm teaching now. And one of the books we just discussed is Laclau's very Gramsci influenced text on uh, populism. And uh, the, the new book in the name of it is Radical Populism. I can't remember. Anyway, the, and his idea of a floating signifier is sort of what you're saying. You've got to You've got to have something, you have to have some way of making a chain of equivalences among different groups so that they feel a coherence and they feel that they can be a people, right? And that uh, right now, neither in uh, Turkey nor in uh, uh, the United States is, let's say, Occupy Wall Street and its Occupy movements in the United States are, are hardly the majority and hardly the loudest voice, nor the, certainly the influential one in, de in uh, democracy, uh, in, in, in the national democratic uh, electoral scene, and they don't want to be, actually. They're, they're refusing that. Um, I, I, uh, I recognize all of that, and uh, I, w I would put it, though, this way, which is, for me, being an intellectual is a form of political intervention, and, um, you know, I, I could do it several ways. I could be the elite, the schoolmaster who knows, who says, I've figured out the ideal order, and, you know, this is what we should have as an alternative institution. I've read enough and I know enough that you better do what I say. I could do that. Um, a, I, I don't know the answer. B, you know, that's the problem of the elitist, the intellectual as, elite, uh, as the elite. Um, or, and this I see is my role today, and it's not totally idealist, it's a practical, pragmatic maneuver. I, I speak as if there were really this new possibility and by and by naming it i i make it easier to think and maybe easier to do so uh it, it really comes out of uh, um realizing that this clash of civilizations led to a dialogue of civilizations and that my interventions because i had written something and not many western intellectuals had that brought a, a dialogue between eastern and western or you know what I'm saying, whatever, with intel intellectuals in two realms, uh, I, I was pretty fed up with that. So, and I thought to myself, nothing makes sense that way. I cannot tell, say that religion is the problem or secularism is the problem. That just doesn't name it, right? Nor does it name it that modern, modernity versus, none of those binaries seem to make sense to me, West versus, uh, uh, the, or, or the Arab world, or none of these things seem to make any sense to make the kinds of distinctions that I wanted to speak about and give space to. So, um, you know, I, the, the, the politics of this paper is to move, you know, to put Davutoglu together with someone he normally isn't 
read together with and, and to make these kinds of juxtapositions so that there are new constellations and that w so that we, you know, rather than say, okay, now we're doing West. I mean, uh, the book that actually is not out yet, but will be coming out in, in uh, with Matisse publishing uh, on Hegel, Haiti, and universal history. I mean, the, the, the punchline of that is that Hegel thought up his master slave dialectic because he was reading in the newspaper about the Haitian Revolution. But there isn't one expert in the field of German philosophy or Hegel studies who has made that claim. Why? Because they do German studies. They do philosophy. They don't do what happens in, in the Caribbean. And so they never put it together. But there are documents that show you that that's exactly what happened. And what I do is write an essay that shows that those things have to be thought together. Okay? So m I don't want to participate as an intellectual in maintaining these boundaries. So I'll, I, you know, for instance, I was invited here to talk about Europe or the West. I, I didn't. <laughs> so I, you know, that, that was definitely, I know that, that maybe that was impolite. But uh, I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have to say, well, I don't, I don't know anything. Oh, and, but this is the thing. So my colleagues say, to me, oh, Susan, you're so courageous to do this. And I, and I say, what do you mean? It's not so difficult. And they say, yes, but I'm not an expert in these things. You know, I'm not an expert in Said Khutb, but I've read everything in English, and they can too. Everything that exists in translation, I've read. So uh, this is what bothers me. I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason why I have to say, oh, this is not my discipline, or this is not my specialty, or how can I talk about that? Because if I'm wrong, you'll correct me. And, you know, how else to do it? Because I can't think without uh, what's been left out of the West. I can't think without that. And I would hope vice versa. So I just really want to get away from anything that would encourage a, an intellectual discussion based on, well, we think this, and you think that, and we understand. You can see that there's a connection between the way you think and the way I think, or we think. It's never I, because I might not think as we think. And believe me, I don't think as we Americans think, right? So um, where is my capacity to speak as a human being? You know, I mean, um, as opposed to um, an American invited to speak to Turkish students in the context of what's happening in Europe or the Europe, uh, what's, uh, what's the name of the series? I'm sorry. But do you see what I'm saying? This is something I, I feel is a political action in a university to try to get out of. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I totally agree with <laughs> what you last said. And I do agree with um, the way you treat the concept of civilization. And of course, I agree with my friend over there too. And um, I would like to say something on the way you interpret uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, I, I too think that it is sort of a revolutionary moment in the Arantian sense. And trying to always bring the issue to the aftermath of the revolution or whatever, you know, that moment, is really uh, bringing yourself into real politic. And uh, what I'm seeing uh, around, it is mostly writers of international relations who are, you know, very much anxious about, well, okay, Tahrir was good, but then what about the aftermath? So I think it's really important to hail the moment as it is, as something which is, you know, without teachers, without Leninist parties, uh, leaders, etc. So that is very, very um, worthy, uh, very precious in my mind. What I would like to ask you to do is to please elaborate let a little more about your understanding of democracy. I think Ahmed Okumush uh, also referred to this because I sense a little bit of ontological color, uh, as if I may say, to your understanding of democracy. And um, for example, you uh, 
articulated the sentence that democracy is the articulation of the general will. I know, of course, uh, you are not uh, trying to say something totalitarian <laughs> in this sense, but still, I think, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at least I should like to hear a little more about democracy and demos. Uh, well, okay. I mean, this is the weak weakness, and uh, Ahmed, you, you really uh, spoke to this point as well. I mean, I, I um, you know, I mean, what do I mean by democracy? <coughs> That's the question. Um, okay, so obviously, well, uh, I would like to say that first thing I mean by democracy is it's something that one knows when one sees it, in other which is terrible, but it, one knows it. I mean, one knows it when one sees it. It's actually true. When you see what's happening on Tahrir Square, you know you're witnessing democracy. Now, that's a totally irrational statement. It's not a, well, you know. Well, that's a moment. It's a moment of democracy, right. But my, uh, yes, and I saw it one other time, and that was I was do working with this book on uh, the Soviet Union. I was in Moscow in eight, 1988, 89, 90, 91, 92, and you could see democracy. You, and you realized that this, anybody, any place in the world is, is capable of this activity. Okay, uh, you know, because they do it. I, I, you know, I mean, they, they were just amazing. The people were, were just amazing, and this isn't a place where you, or, or the fall of the Berlin Wall. I mean, these things, people do it. Now, I agree that the, the people who do it, who are elated and do it beautifully, you know, then they start worrying about, oh, you know, I'm not really like them, and what are we going to do about getting a job, and we have to worry about our own life, et cetera. Uh, and that, then that euphoria disappears. But I don't think that's a reason to deny, I mean, okay, let's put it this way. I don't think the fact that an experience is temporary makes it deniable. I don't think that mystics, have a mystical experience 24-7. That doesn't deny the experience. I don't think people are in love 24-7 or maybe even more than six months or two years or whatever. Okay, three. <laughs> but, but they were in love. And you can see it. You can walk and see a couple on the street and you know they're in love. Now, uh, that's an intu intuition. I don't think it's necessarily irrational. But you do. You know it. Um, these are affective states. So I guess my definition of democracy is also a kind of affect. Um, we are trained in a world to think that it can't exist. We come into the world and we're taught we have to worry about ourselves, etc. And, uh, and that if we didn't have all these rules and laws, we would be total animals. And then we find out, no, that doesn't happen. And it's such an a, a, a extraordinary uh, realization. I guess what I would just say is, even as a memory, I mean, remember what Kant said about the enthusiasm of the French Revolution. He said, even if the revolution fails, even if it doesn't, the very fact that people watching it had a sense of solidarity, no matter what their class background was, with the act, the, the, the revolutionaries, is something that even if it fails, it will never be forgotten. Now, I think that plays into what's happening here. But I, I would like to add to it what's happening here, which was actually also what was happening there, because it was happening in Haiti, it was happening all over. It's, it is a universal thing. It isn't, in other words, the problem of the construction of the people, that happens when the elite gets to the writing of the Constitution. But the act of revolution itself, is not one where you have to define the people. I mean, what happened spontaneously at Tahrir Square? Demonstrators defended Copts, uh, made sure that praying Muslims were protected. Uh, women were there with men, but protected and given respect, unlike what the police does to women, right? So all of that happened, it happened. Now, uh, the fact that it doesn't stay, the fact that truth is fleeting, 
I think mystics feel that way. I think Walter Benjamin felt that way. I, I don't think robs it of its truth value. Uh, that sounded good, but it doesn't get me out of the problem, I know, <laughs> because the problem's still there. But it's the memory that I, it inspires. If it inspires the construction of the institutions, then we're in a way better space than if, oh my God, you can't trust the people, so let's make sure. What did the United States do? They ran into Poland after the fall of the Soviet Union and said, okay, we've got just the way to write a constitution. Don't write it like we did. Bad. You know, because you never can tell what's going to happen. Write it in the way that only the person who gets the, you know, you put your first, second, and third choice, and you won't get your first choice, but you'll get your second and third, and that will make sure that, quote, no extremist gets elected. Well, you know what? Democracy is about risk. And it's about trusting the people, or trusting people. But not the people, people. And, you know, uh, one can be very naive about this, but, you know, it's just like saying, oh, well, Love doesn't matter. I'll just marry for money. No. You, I mean, and love won't work in a marriage either. I'm not saying, you know, but you don't give up on love. You don't give up on these things. Now, I mean, that sounds just so sappy. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the significance of experiences that are life-changing uh, has to be r respected. two points somehow interrelated, I hope. Uh, first of all, it makes so much sense that uh, Minister Davutoglu speaks about civilizations because it relates directly to, uh, I, I'm not trying to reduce, of course, the claim, but it relates directly to, uh, to representing a totality that goes beyond the limits of nation state and demos. And it kind of gives you the comfort, so-called, of articulating a general will or dealing with the inconveniences yes. of the uh, existing nation states. So uh, it kind of postulates a civilizational totality, sort of cultural and religious totality, in the name of which you claim to speak. That's one thing. Uh, and second of all, uh, I don't think, of course, uh, Huntington's clash of civilization thesis made, uh, made the world a better place, but certainly the dialogue of civilizations kind of claim has, uh, has not made the world a better place either because uh, to my great disappointment, for example, I see uh, in a subtle way, actually, he doesn't employ the concept of uh, civilization, but he uh, somehow speaks of something like a civilizational totality, John Rawls, one of the uh, egalitarian uh, liberal, liberal philosophers uh, of, the century, uh, of the 20th century, the greatest one in my, in my mind, actually. Uh, he, for example, his book, The Love of Peoples on International Relations, is such a disappointment, which is actually beyond uh, the disappoint disappointment one might uh, get out of civil... Uh, the crude and uh, vulgar thesis of uh, Huntington, because I think uh, in a way uh, uh, postulating that there are cultural entities, pre-political entities, yeah. is, uh, and claiming that we have to respect them, I mean, you have to, of course, he's speaking as an American <laughs> citizen. Uh, actually, in this case, uh, it leads us to the first paradox that you have been talking about in this lecture, the paradox of uh, extreme social and economic inequality. Uh, this uh, kind of a rosy claim of respect for uh, other religious cultural entities actually yeah. seems uh, like uh, legitimizing and uh, saying that we have nothing to agree upon on such a basic level that uh, we can only claim that wha whatever inequality existing in the world is their own cultural so-called problem or their own uh, civilizational problem. So uh, I think even when we reverse the value judgments in terms of uh, negative or positive, we still have a very problematic case of uh, a set of analytical uh, perspectives here that in a way, uh, in a way uh, that is severely criticized by Edward Said, dividing the reality of humanity into uh, this construed uh, fragments or 
particles. Yeah. Thank so you. it wasn't a question. One last question, because are okay. Because he deals with all these questions of civilization as a grad student. <laughs> I, uh, I share this suspicious towards uh, stance, let's say, towards ontology. But um, recently, for instance, not very recently, but George Lukas, Antonio Negri, tried try to remind remind Marxists that that Marx himself himself wasn't ignoring, ignoring the ontological level, for instance, uh, but at le or uh, at least uh, if he was not ignorant, he was um, having a critical stance towards it in a negative sense, per perhaps. So today we're t talking about uh, democracy in the process of completion, perhaps, or incomplete d democracy with the contributions of others, let's say. Uh, so they have these ontological baggages, metaphysical, connections, faith, as Mohamed Okumush has also said. So you coming from a Marxist critical Frankfurt School tradition, and um, I mean, I haven't read many of your writings, but at least I've read a few articles in this uh, recent book on critical, Isla critical theory and Islamism on the left. Um, do you think that you, you should, or leftists or Marxist or should go beyond this, um, um, I mean, what I see is like an ignorance towards ontology, not, 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 not a negative stance towards it taking, it, take it, taking it seriously into consideration and dealing with it and perhaps fighting against it. Um, and this, in my view, provides a, creates a problem because if we're speaking of democracy to be completed with the contributions of the rest of the world, and we have to find a way to deal with their ontological baggages, with the metaphysical claims, religions, whatever, that they bring with themselves to this global public sphere that you were talking about. Uh, that's a good, uh, good comment. I, I, I have to think more about it, but I'm, I, I, want, I want to maybe question whether... Um, um, I mean, I know very, very often people will argue on the basis of their on, ontological position, that they feel this is, the, this is their belief or this is their basic. They start from here. They start from a certain point. Um, I, I just don't quite, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a suspicious of that claim um, because I think that things are much more contextual. No, if I can, if I say that I'm progressive, you know that that's my ontological position, and there are certain neuroscientists who will say that, for instance, Democratic Party voters have one piece of brain that lights up with a certain thing, and the Republicans have another. I think it's crazy, right? Um, I think people change. I think people's positions change, and uh, the idea is not to try to say, oh, these people are thinking incorrectly. Let's get them to think correctly. Um, and I don't think that any of the things that count about democracy have to begin by saying, well, in the first place, you know, like for instance, I'm a woman that's ontologically different, so therefore, you know, certain things follow from that for democracy. I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure whether any kind of ontological difference, I, I know it can be used as the first paragraph in an argument, but I don't know if it's actually the, the most um, adequate way to enter the political debate uh, because you know how it is. I mean, you know, we all feel this way. In my family, we always feel this way. But then you know, you know, if you, in other words, what I'm trying to say is in my tired way, there, there's this country, we in the United States think, right? We as Democrats think. We as people in New York City think, right? We in my family think, and then I realize my sister votes for Republican, and I realize we can't even have a we there. And then if I think of my husband, you know, well, we sh don't always have a we there either. So, I, you know, I just don't see where the ontological um, boundary holds, um, except that it, I think it's, a, a psycho it's, it's an imaginary structuring of a conceptual terrain. And that if we don't, you know, if we don't go that route, 
uh, as I tried not to here, there are other things that come to the surface. But if you start, like if you start saying, okay, I'm going to do German intellectual history, you'll never see Haiti. If you say, okay, this is where I stand, you never see where you might be connected to something because you've already made the boundary. And ontology does that. It bounds definitions. Adorno said, never start with a definition. You know, if you want to know what freedom is, never start by saying, well, first we have to define freedom. Aha, that's good, my answer now. We don't have to first define democracy, you know. Because then you've already, you know, you, you've made your definition and then it's easy. Either something is or is not democratic. <laughs> but uh, concepts don't work that way. And actually, if we wanted to get really uh, philosophical about it, that would be the Hegelian residue, uh, the residue of Hegel's logic and Adorno's thinking, you know, because how I define reality is going to be the way reality looks back at me, right? And that, in turn, will define me. So it's a dialectic. Uh, and if I start with an ontology, you know, I've already loaded the cards in one direction. So it's anti-definitional, even, as a way of talking about philosophy. I better stop and have some coffee. Okay, thank you. No, I'm, I just finished it. Finished? Yes, Chips. I mean, you know, I just wrote it for this occasion and I just finished it. Ah, now. okay. But you yeah. get it as soon as it's okay. uh, next week. Okay. Finished I'll, it, I'll okay. send it. Okay. And you did not even have a rest after your. No. Travel? That was the thing. Because uh, I, thought, I thought I was right. speaking tomorrow night. Uh, that was my mistake. But I found out no, when I arrived no. that I was speaking now. To me, you gave it to me, and I have it someplace. But you okay, better but write it again. Write you better write it again. Because I have so, a, yeah. you're, When are you leaving? I, so I'm leaving on Monday. On Monday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. It's so short. It's so tiring. <laughs> because I'm, 